you look at gear, you look at speed, lane position, um, you look at what did the motorcyclist do in those last few seconds before there was an impact. How do you evaluate a motorcycle accident claim in San Francisco? We're going to talk to attorney Claude Weil from San Francisco about that on today's Ask the Lawyer. Claude, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Molly. I really appreciate it. And I'm very eager to talk about motorcycle cases. Definitely one of your passions. We know that. So first off, how do you evaluate the strength of a motorcycle accident case in terms of liability and potential damages? Well, first of all, you can evaluate a motorcycle case much like any automobile case and look at the violations of the vehicle code that the offending driver committed. However, once you establish that, there are many nuances and twists for motorcycle cases that a lawyer has to know in order to properly present the case. Um, of course, the first thing we look at is, was there a violation of the vehicle code? Did the defendant do something like failure to maintain a proper lookout? Look where they're going before they make a lane change. That's a very common scenario with motorcycle cases. Um, and then we look at the motorcyclist behavior. We try not to focus on what the motorcyclist did wrong, but as motorcycle lawyers of many, many years experience, we kind of know what's coming. And even if it looks like it's all the defendant's fault, the offending drivers, we know that they're going to get smart lawyers and they're going to try and lay some liability off on the motorcyclist because people have a lot of prejudice against motorcyclists. Things like speed, things like lane sharing or lane positioning, um, coming out of nowhere, not being visible. We know that this is coming. So from the very beginning, the way we evaluate the case is by looking at what evidence can we gather to support our clients' claims and defenses that our client was also comparatively negligent. We want to head that off at the pass. We don't make up evidence, but we want to gather all the evidence and we know what to look for. When you find the evidence to protect your client, that will carry you through the end of the case. As far as the damages are concerned, motorcyclists, because they don't have a cage around them because there's no metal protecting them, they tend to get hurt worse. And you have to be adept at evaluating things like um, nerve injuries from a back injury. A lot of people get neck and back sprains and strains, but you have to be asking the right questions of your clients to determine if they have a more serious sprain or strain that involves a nerve problem. Maybe they're going to need surgery. Maybe they're going to need future care. Then perhaps you get them lined up with the right doctors who could address their needs and help them in the beginning of the case, as opposed to just trying to play catch up and try and fix a problem that's gone on too far. So as part of our evaluation process, we also try to get our clients the help they need medically. So, Claude, you spoke about trying to determine somebody's injuries. Are there other factors that you look at when you're trying to look at how much a case might be worth? Yeah, I'm going to be very, very blunt, which I don't think most lawyers are. Personal injury lawyers operate on a contingency fee. That means if we're successful, we get a percentage of the recovery. Our clients don't have to come up with anything up front. We advance our time, we advance our money. So in order to stay in business, personal injury lawyers, especially motorcycle lawyers, have got to be very careful about the cases that we accept. And we evaluate a case, it's on a sliding scale. If there is an obvious, serious or catastrophic injury, we will perhaps accept a case that has tougher liability because ultimately, with a bigger injury, it has the potential to create more exposure for the defendant and the case is more likely to get settled. A big injury is going to be more scary for the defendant. That doesn't mean they just roll over if you have a big injury. You still have to establish your liability and prove your liability, but it's a sliding scale. If it looks like maybe it was a 50-50 case that two different parties were liable then you might still take the case if the injury is serious because there's enough there to get a good settlement for your client. Um, that is very blunt, but every personal injury lawyer goes through this evaluation process. If the case is big, they're more likely to take it even if the liability is challenging. That doesn't mean you can make something out of nothing. Jurors are smart. 
they're, they're, you're not going to fool anybody, but it means that there's something to talk about. And perhaps you can get jurors or a judge to evaluate on a comparative basis. So are there any specific aspects of motorcycle accident cases that might increase or decrease their value in terms of the legal context in San Francisco? There are so many, so many. Um, safety gear. Safety gear is one that we think is important. You are trying to go against the the stigma of being on a motorcycle in the first place. Many people are prejudiced. They think motorcyclists ride too fast. That's the next thing. Speed. How do you, from the beginning, determine if there really is evidence of speed or if it's just concocted by a defendant when they say, I never saw him. Oh, he was going so fast. You have to be able to look at that and say, how do you know he was going fast if you never saw him? Right? So there is safety gear, a proper helmet, leathers good protective armor, boots. These things are all important because they can be used against a motorcyclist down the road to detract from the value of the case. Let's say they have um, a bunch of abrasions and they weren't wearing a good protective jacket. Well, you know, a smart defense lawyer can say, sorry, but you should have been wearing better gear. So you look at gear, you look at speed, lane position, um, you look at what did the motorcyclist do in those last few seconds before there was an impact? What choices did a motorcyclist have? If they had no choices, was there lack of choice from their own creation or were they just doing everything right? So the things that make the value go up or go down are basically conduct of the motorcyclist. Of course, a big injury and absolute liability on the part of the offending driver that makes the case go up, but you have to look at the gear. You have to look at that helmet. Are they wearing one of those ridiculous little novelty helmets? I'm sorry, but those are terrible. You get a brain injury there. You have to be thinking about whether or not you're going to be suing the helmet manufacturer and the people who sold the motorcyclist that helmet. Too many motorcyclists wear these novelty helmets because for some motorcyclists, they're almost irresistible. They are uh, better looking. They're lighter. They um, they have so much going for them, except they don't protect a motorcyclist's head. So if I was a defense lawyer, I would make a big deal about somebody wearing an inadequate helmet. So we look right away, what's our client wearing? How fast was our client going? What's the speed that our client was traveling? What were they doing? What kind of turning motions were they doing in their lane? Were, was the motorcyclist paying attention? We, we are old hands at determining what the offending driver did. But the next thing to look at is, well, how much is our own motorcyclist conduct going to be detracting from the gross value? And if we can establish the facts and the evidence to start with in the beginning of the case that fight the normal defenses for a motorcycle case, then we are a long way along in winning that case. We've seen it. A lot of these injuries can be lifelong and devastating uh, following a motorcycle accident. How do you assess the long-term impact of injuries sustained in a motorcycle accident regarding the overall value of the case? Well, you have to know what you're looking at. Um, really, with motorcycle cases, there are a lot of sneaky uh, long-term symptoms that come up. Um, if somebody just has a shoulder sprain in a car accident, let's say, there's a good chance they're going to recover. But it's been our experience that if somebody is knocked off their motorcycle, they land on the pavement, they roll several times on the pavement, they fetch up against the curb very hard or against a building, or they hit a pole on the way, that's going to cause more than your little whiplash type injury. So a lot of times you, you have to adopt a wait and see and you educate the motorcyclist, your client, you educate them what symptoms to look out for and you send them questionnaires and you ask them the questions and you really probe because everybody wants to say, I'm okay, I'm okay. Remember when we were kids, you get hit in the head with a baseball, you, you stand up, you're totally dizzy and you yell out to your friends, I'm okay. That's what everybody wants to say. They, they want to be okay. And it's our job 
to really tease out if they are okay or whether they're likely to have problems in the future and whether they're likely to need medical care in the future. So it takes a lot of experience to recognize the injuries that may not just be transient, that may not just be totally temporary, and to try to evaluate in advance what might be permanent. When you're looking at these cases, what would you say are the most important parts of evidence or types of evidence that you typically gather and analyze to assess the merits and potential worth of an accident claim? Well, of course, you need to look at the crash site. You need to look at the police report. The In California, the opinions of the police officer as to fault are not evidence. They are not allowed to come in and say what the well the police officer said it was the motorcycle's fault. You start from scratch, but you can use a lot in the police report f- as the basis of your own argument for liability. And um, so the first thing you do is you, you go to the scene, you look at the vehicle, you save the vehicle, you save the motorcycle, you try and get photos of the offending vehicle, you try to get photos and measurements of any scrape marks on the road. These things might show speed because tire friction marks and skid marks for a motorcycle, that really doesn't prove anything. And you um, you establish things from the beginning for liability, looking at the vehicles, looking at the scene, um, maybe get an expert to take measurements, to do video. And then for damages, you immediately look at what was in the medical record. Did they pick up on everything that that the client is suffering from, if they did not, if they did not even test for it in the very beginning of the case, you get a client to a medical provider who can help evaluate if they are hurt very seriously. And if they're not, great, we're happy. If they are, we have to prove it. And so you start working on the proof of their damages from the beginning and you establish liability as early as you can and you gather up all the evidence you can. The key to this whole process is in gathering and preserving evidence. So the first thing we do, if if our client is head injured, say, talk to the client's mom, talk to the client's girlfriend or boyfriend, talk to the client's brother or sister, and try to gather the information so that we'll have what we need and what the defense will need down the road. We're gathering up our evidence to put on our best case. And sometimes if we have no evidence and we have the burden of proof, We have a problem if we have no evidence. So we make sure we get it right away. Claudia, you're always so knowledgeable on this topic. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. I'm always happy to talk about motorcycle cases. We're very happy to represent a lot of motorcyclists in our community and be part of the motorcycle community throughout Northern California. Thank you for asking me questions. It's something I appreciate talking about. Absolutely. We'll see you soon. And that's going to do it for this episode of Ask the Lawyer. My guest has been attorney Claude Weil of San Francisco. If you want to ask him about your case, call the number on your screen. Thanks for watching. I'm Molly Hendrickson for Ask the Lawyers.